years. And when I was a sophomore in 1947, the genius of Francis Pendle and Gaines brought James G. Labron to this campus, uh, who had been master of Pearson College at Yale University. And I had the privilege of his courses. And then graduating in 49, had the privilege of coming back and, uh, well, it would be um, something to say that I worked with Dr. Lehman, but I did work for Frank Gillen in our office to join Dr. Lehman. So you can imagine the great thrill and experience that I had through my lifetime, or very much of it, at Washington and Lee. Uh, we all know Dr. Lehman's work, uh, the Scotch Irish, certainly the modern and definitive work on the Scotch Irish immigration. Uh, Dr. Lehman is now living in Williamsport. He left Martinsburg and his watercress farm. And he's been very idle in Williamsport. He's just published the memoirs of Durham, North Carolina, which was published by Echo Press this year. Um, a, a giant for Washington and Lee people. And as I look out here, I would guess that 90% of us have this great privilege. Um, a wonderful experience and wonderful privilege for me to not introduce, but to say, thank goodness, Dean Labor could be with us this evening. suggested that I talk to this uh, group about the Scotch-Irish migrations. He said that he imagined that at least half the alum our alumni were Scotch-Irish. I agree with that uh, estimate, although I probably should say at least half of our alumni have at least some Scotch-Irish ancestors. But immediately a whole series of questions arises who were and who are the Scotch-Irish, and why that double name, which, incidentally, <coughs> either the Scots nor the Irish recognize or ever use. <laughs> and I want to come back to that in a few moments. Uh, when and why did they migrate to a, the American colonies, and where did they settle and why? And then one other question, did they make a distinctive contribution to uh, American history? Before I begin to answer these questions, I'd like to comment on what seems to me to be one of the great ironies of history. When one reflects on the long, age-long antagonism between Englishmen and Irishmen, and between Catholics and Protestants in Ireland, it seems profoundly ironic that it was the Catholic Pope, Adrian IV, who in 1155 <coughs> turned over the whole of Ireland to the English King Henry II, and Henry, I'm reading now, Henry was to have Ireland as an inheritance on condition that he should reduce the, to order, the Irish church and state. Now consider the ramifications of that act. I think it's ironic that Ireland, as you certainly know from your reading and perhaps already from your lectures, that Ireland had a distinctive culture <coughs> and had contributed a great deal to the Catholic faith when the English were still mostly barbarian. And yet now, Ireland was being turned over to the English. The irony increases when England, now in control, within four centuries became Protestant, and yet Ireland remained faithful to the Catholic religion and all it taught. 
And from that irony, of course, stems the long religious controversy and antagonism between the Roman Catholics and the Protestants in Ireland, as particularly we are aware in the northern part of Ireland just now. A rather diverting aspect of this irony is that among the thousands of English people who came over to Ireland and took English, uh, took Irish lands and settled there, very frequently they became even more Irish than the Irish themselves. And as you probably know from your reading, uh, many of these former Englishmen became leaders in the movement for Irish independence from England. And as a final irony, many of these Protestant Englishmen contributed to the glory of Irish literature, as witnessed, for example, Dean Swift and Oliver Goldsmith and Bishop Barclay in the 1700s, and Yeats and Singh and Lady Gregory in our own century. Now for a brief account of how the Scotch-Irish people came into being. Queen Elizabeth, who was beset by problems on every hand, thought to solve her Irish dissidence and the constant disturbances in Ireland by colonizing that Ireland with English Protestants. But it was her successor, King James I of England, James, who was also James VI of Scotland, who succeeded in carrying out that scheme. A whole series of events, which I shall not go into right now, but which you will be hearing about tomorrow morning when President Wilson talks to you, a whole series of events made it possible for thousands of acres in the northern part of Ireland, Ulster, to escheat, as the technical term is, to the crown of England. Uh, Ulster is this northern part of Ireland. This, uh, this Ireland has four divisions, Ulster, Connaught, uh, Leinster, and Munster. And in this northern part, the two earls, the Earl of Tyrone and the Earl of Tyrconnell, after their defeat, left Ulster, deserted Ulster altogether, the flight of the earls, it's called, and all of their lands then became a part, became the property of the crown of England. And the peasants who had been farmers on the lands of these two earls then fled to the mountains, so that the northern part of Ireland was practically empty. King James then, in 1610, I don't know how much interested you are in dates, but that's a good one to stick in your mind, in 1610 uh, gave practically the whole of Ulster to his favorites on condition that they would bring Protestant immigrants into their lands from Scotland and England to settle there in this, what the historians call the plantation of Ulster. And by granting these whole areas of Ulster to his favorites, he pledged them to bring over as many of these Protestants from Scotland and England as they possibly could. And of course, they were eager to do that, because if their lands were to be productive, they needed settlers. And so each of them sought to bring as many as possible of the Protestants from their countries. Thousands of impoverished lowland Scots eagerly crossed the narrow channel over to Ireland. And if you can see this map, here is Ulster, here is lowland Scotland, and you can see that there's only a channel of about 15 or 20 miles at the nearest point from Scotland Lowland Scotland over into Ireland, so that the passage was a, 
very easy one for them to make. And as I say, thousands of impoverished lowland Scots eagerly crossed the channel into Ireland and took up farms there on very easy terms that were granted them by the landlords, thus exchanging their somewhat barren and certainly overpopulated farms, farm regions in Scotland for the lush acres in Ulster. One part of their agreement was to see to it that the mere Irish, and hear the sneer in that phrase, that the mere Irish be kept away from the, their former lands and uh, kept up in the mountains. And that sneer, by the way, uh, reflects the attitude of the British toward the mere Irish throughout all of these centuries. The lowland Scots who crossed over in, into Ulster were almost to a man stalwart and even passionate Presbyterians. And they were guaranteed complete freedom of their religion and the practice of their faith when they came over into Ulster. Here I must indulge on in a, a side. It's uh, understandable that when people become interested in tracing their family backgrounds, they should hope to find distinguished ancestors or at least colorful ones. <laughs> well, that uh, hope is unlikely to be real realized when we trace our earliest Scotch-Irish ancestry. The Scots who crossed into Ulster were practically all impoverished farmers in search of better lands and an escape from poverty. They were not lairds or gentry. Those upper class substantial citizens did not migrate over to Ulster. In fact, you will find that in the history of migration, upper classes and middle classes very rarely migrate. Why should they? They already have an established position for themselves, so what would be their reason for migration? So they, the gentry of Scotland, did not migrate. It was the impoverished farmers in search of a better life who came over into Ireland. As for discovering picturesque ancestors, once again, our Scotch-Irish ancestors would hardly qualify. Sir Walter Scott, in his novels and poetry, lent considerable glamour to the Scots. And many of us almost automatically think of uh, Scottish clansmen in their tartans and their sporans, marching down the glens behind skirling bagpipes and uh, it's all very romantic. But Sir Walter's romantic Scots were almost entirely Highlanders, <coughs> not Lowlanders. And they, the Highlanders, did not migrate to Ulster. They were not our Scotch-Irish ancestors. I should add that Lowland Scots regarded these Highlanders pretty much as barbarians, or almost barbarians who lived by fighting and raiding. They mostly spoke Gaelic, not English. They were Roman Catholics. They seemed positive to enjoy fighting each other and feuding with each other instead of living productive lives. So I repeat, Sir Walter's Scots were often romantic figures but they were certainly not our Scotch-Irish ancestors. Um, if you want to know the difference, uh, the location of the lowlanders and the highlanders, the lowlanders were in this region nearest Ulster, as you see, all of this region on the border of England, and up toward the um, north on the Atlantic side, the highlanders were in this region and if you could see this map more clearly, you could see that the mountains are there, and that's where the 
the Highlanders were, and in the islands off there. And it was the Highlanders who did not migrate, the Lowlanders, the farmers, who did migrate. If you want to find admirable traits in the Lowlanders who went to Ulster, look at what these ordinary farmers achieved after their crossing. They very quickly made Ulster the most prosperous province in Ireland. They succeeded in greatly improving their own standard of living. They kept order in what was at that time a wilderness. They remained a deeply moral and religious people. And so Ulster very soon became the most orderly and I believe too the most prosperous part of Ireland. So that is something that we can really be proud of in these humble ancestors of ours. Now for a paradox. These ordinary lowland Scots not only made a success of farming, but they very soon developed the linen and woolen trades, industries and trades to add to the prosperity of Ulster. Yet their very success was one of the chief reasons for the first migration of Scotch-Irish to America in 1717. And before I explain that curious paradox, let me tell you that between 1717, and once again, I don't want to um, inflict too many dates on you, but 1717 is when the first group of Scotch-Irish came over to America. Between 1717 and the outbreak of the Revolutionary War in 1775, some 200 to 250,000 Ulster Scots, Scots, uh, Scotch-Irish as we call them now, came over to the American colonies. That means that by the time of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, they were second only in, to the English group, English uh, population in the American colonies. It's estimated that one-sixth of the whole population of the American colonies by 1776 were Scotch-Irish. They had come over in five great waves and their favorite port of entry was Philadelphia. Could I have the map now? You can see where uh, they came up the Delaware River, and here is Philadelphia on the Delaware. And that was their main port of entry, as I say. And so many of them migrated, and from there went westward across the southern border of Pennsylvania into the valley of Virginia and so on down into North Carolina and South Carolina and eventually to Georgia. So many of them, I say, came that that road westward along the southern border of Pennsylvania became known as the Great Philadelphia Wagon Road. It was so well traveled. You are familiar with the adage that what induces a reluctant donkey to move is a carrot before or a stick behind. Now five waves of migrants from Ulster to America came, the first in 1717 and 1718, and they displayed such sticks and carrots. I'd like to tell you in some detail of the uh, sticks and carrots that impelled that first group of Scotch-Irish to undertake the, undertake the perilous journey across the Atlantic into an unknown region. And by the way, the journey across the Atlantic, Atlantic was really perilous in those days. Six weeks and a very small ship, no telling how many shipwrecks or what suffering they would have to endure and to go into an entirely unknown land required a great deal of intestinal fortitude. 
these first 5,000 who went in those two years were true pioneers. Now let me tell you first about the stick behind that drove them out of a good thing, or what looked like a good thing, in Ulster. Four generations of lowland Scots in Ulster, and remember they had been there now from 1610, four, at least four generations of lowland Scots in Ulster had made such a success that some of their descendants were actually becoming well-to-do, especially with the development and the manufacture and trade in linen and woolen goods. The English Parliament, alarmed then at this competition that uh, the Ulster farmers and manufacturers and traders, the competition with the English goods from a mere colony, the English Parliament imposed severe restrictions on North Island exports. <coughs> Prosperity and initiative, that is to say, were now being rewarded with ingratitude and curves, and the result was a pretty severe depression. Much more important than these restrictions was rack renting. That's an unfamiliar term to us. Jonathan Swift, like many others, considered rack renting the primary cause of migration from Ulster to America. Let me explain that unfamiliar term. The favorites to whom King James I had uh, granted all these lands in Ulster had uh, rented the lands on very favorable terms in leases extending through 31 years and at very low rents. But now, in 1717, the population of Ulster had very decidedly increased, and so the landlords, very naturally, wanted to raise the rents when the leases expired. This is what was called rent renting, because the farmers, having been used to living on these particular lands, having developed them as they had been developed, felt that they were really being fleeced. They regarded it, regarded all these raises and rents as exorbitant and as decidedly unfair. And a large number of them then, either unwilling or unable to pay these higher rents, looked for an alternative, and of course that alternative was the possible migration to the American colonies. By far the most compelling stick behind, in my opinion, however, was the fact that for six years after 1714, year after year, for six years, there was intensive drought that ruined all their crops. And in addition to this, at the very same moment, their sheep began to develop a, a destructive disease known as rot. Food prices, in Northern Ireland soared because of failed crops. And economic min misery, therefore, was a powerful stick behind. Present, but uh, very much less important, in my opinion, is a rather surprising uh, set of religious instruction, restrictions. Queen Anne, with her very high church affiliations and her ministers decreed that all office holders in Ulster must now take the sacraments of the Church of England and that no marriage could be considered valid unless it was performed by a Church of England clergyman. But you can imagine that the staunch Presbyterians resented these restrictions. But in my opinion, that religious restriction was a really a very minor cause of the migration to America. I think that, as I say again, the main stick behind was the fact that their crops failed year after year after year for six whole years, and the wreck renting. Now, if these sticks behind were painful, 
one carrot before was particularly enticing. The steady reports of an almost Garden of Eden in the American colony of Pennsylvania. Prosperity of every colony, of course, depended on uh, an increase in population of an industrious uh, group of settlers. But around 1700, in the years just before 1700, migration into the American colonies from England had almost ceased. And it was at that juncture that William Penn, who in my opinion was one of the shrewdest and most capable of the um, early American uh, colonists, quickly undertook the very unusual enterprise of traveling to Europe to try to persuade people in Europe to migrate to his colony of Pennsylvania. He perceived that thousands of substantial Europeans at that very juncture were undergoing all kinds of civil and religious restrictions. And to these solid, industrious, conscientious, plain people, he promised complete religious freedom in his colony and abundance of land at such low rates that it seemed to many of them to be almost free land and the complete right to follow to follow their preferred standard and uh, way of daily life. More than that, as a Quaker, he had established peaceful relations with the Indians in Pennsylvania and his whole southern territory there, so that there was a biding peace in the colonies. <coughs> in his colony. And that meant, therefore, that these people felt, if we migrate to Pennsylvania, we shall not be in any danger from these American Indians whom we know nothing about. His journeyings to Europe were eminently successful, and thousands of German and Swiss farmers, Amish, Mennonite, Moravians, and soon thereafter Lutherans and Reformed, flooded into Pennsylvania. News of their prosperity, of their success, of their freedom, together with the continued reports of the abundance of rich, inexpensive land, was a carrot of enormous appeal to the disgruntled Ulsterman just then suffering from so many painful goads behind. And so, in the years 1717 and 1718, more than 5,000 of these people took the fateful step of leaving for the New World. Now, 5,000 may seem to you to be a very small number, and so it is. But they were the true pioneers, as I say. They opened the way to the people who would come after them and the reports that they sent back were so enthusiastic that people in Ulster now realized that there was an alternative to distress in the home country. The second wave of migration, beginning in 1725 and lasting for five years, 1725, clear through 1729, opened the sluice gates. Reasons for the departure of these Scotch-Irish were the same as before, and I won't repeat the details. Drought, famine, poverty, all of these were so dire in Ulster in those years that the English Parliament became alarmed at the exodus to America. And on this side, the ocean, Secretary Logan of the Pennsylvania Provincial Council was simply disturbed, almost distraught, by the floods 
coming into his colony. He wrote in his diary, it looks as if Ireland is to send all its inhabitants hither. Last week's, last week, six ships arrived at Philadelphia. Now, in this enormous four or five year second wave, the carrot had become extremely attractive. And as I say, the reports that they sent, the second migrants sent back to Ulster, aroused so much enthusiasm that a great many people who really weren't in distress began to wonder whether they too should not, not migrate to this Garden of Eden across the ocean. I'm not going to clutter your minds with details of the final three waves of migration. I'll merely say, if you want the dates, the first one came in 1740 and 41, the second in the middle of the 1750s, and the last migration in the four years just before the Revolutionary War broke out in the 1770s. Let me say only that this third wave in 1740 and 1741 is particularly interesting to us in this audience who know the Shenandoah Valley. It was people from this migration who settled Rockbridge and Augusta counties, founded the academy that grew into Washington and Lee, and made these two counties, according to local historians, the most Scotch-Irish counties in the whole of the United States. Several facts about this 1740 and 41 uh, migration particularly interest us. Landing at Philadelphia, and I have the map again, but landing at Philadelphia and finding other Scotch-Irish and German settlers in possession of the lands nearest the Delaware River. They went farther west, and then as other uh, Scotch-Irish and other Germans came into the region, a deep frog movement began. As immigrants came, obviously the only thing to do was to go beyond them to the west. And then they went, the next group went still further to the west, and there they came to the mountains. And from that point on, they crossed into this narrow little strip of Maryland, western Maryland, into the Valley of Virginia. And so they leapfrog all the way down the Valley of Virginia into the back country of the North Carolina, of, of the Carolinas, and even into Georgia. So that leapfrog pattern, I think, is a particularly interesting one. Those of you who are familiar with the valley will remember that, uh, or will know that up around Winchester, the Scotch-Irish influence is really very strong, and yet the counties just to the south you know, Winchester, Shenandoah County, and Rockingham County have a great many German names and uh, <coughs> faiths of German origin. And then you come to Augusta County and Rockbridge County with the Scotch-Irish names and the Presbyterian churches that just abound all over both of those counties. Not all the ships from Belfast, which is the port, of course, in uh, Northern Ireland, that's where most of them left. Not all of them came to these Delaware River ports of Philadelphia and Chester. A few, well, a considerable number, headed rather for Boston and New York, and the immigrants there then went into the back country of New England and of New York. And you can see their success in establishing themselves by some of the place names in those northern colonies. Those of you who know New Hampshire, for example, will probably remember the name of London Derry, which is, of course, named for a place in Ulster. Or in New York, up the Hudson River, Ulster County. And you can see again that they had made a success of settling there. Indeed, by the 
elk time of the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, Scotch Irish settlers then were present in every single colony, all the way from Maine, clear down in the back country, through New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Present, I say, in all 13 colonies. And that, I think, is a, a fact of considerable importance, as I'll show you in just a moment. <clears throat> One particular development interests me since the Scotch Irish immigration from 1717 to 1775, when all immigration to the colonies ceased. All these immigrants were Presbyterians, and that meant, or practically all of them, and that meant that they must have an educated clergy. But here, a real problem presented itself. Very few graduates of the four Scottish universities were, could be lured to come over to the wild frontier regions of America to take up an unknown life in the wilderness. <coughs> and so the pioneers solved their problem by founding <coughs> academies to train young Presbyterian ministers. To cite only two cases, in 1726, a Presbyterian minister, Gilbert Tennant, in Neshaminy, Pennsylvania, established what came to be called a log cabin college, a log college, I should say, in the study of his manse. And he trained so many Presbyterian ministers and other Presbyterian youth, and so successfully that within a very few years, a college, a Presbyterian college, could be founded in Princeton, New Jersey. That was in 1746. To cite one other case, and a very familiar one to us, in 1749, a minister in the Valley of Virginia opened an academy in connection with his pastorate in Augusta County, just to the north of Rockbridge, that eventually became Washington and the University. And from this time forward, wherever Presbyterians migrated westward, they became leaders in founding academies and colleges in the frontier regions. As immigration increased in the 1730s and 1740s, pioneers were coming constantly into contact with American Indians, who were being steadily pushed out of their tribal lands by the encroaching settlers. The white newcomers <coughs> wanted land belonging to these Indians, and they took it. And it was at this juncture and this is a rather interesting historical fact. It's at this juncture that hostility between pioneers and Indians came to be a familiar part of American history and folklore. Scotch-Irish pioneers very quickly learned the familiar uh, Indian way of fighting. Instead of a head-on attack, to use stealth, and surprise, and that, as I say, established the American way of fighting Indians. And when the Revolutionary War came, these settlers, now adept at Indian methods, contributed an invaluable element to the success of George Washington. Expert now in the use of guns, they knew how to hide behind trees rather than to face the enemy in serried ranks, in uniform of uniform soldiers. Another thing these later pioneers learned was that in order to defend their homes and their families, <coughs> they must often take things into their own hands without waiting for the approval or 
the aid of the colonial administrators and authorities. I wish there were time to tell you some of the independent outbreaks <coughs> that took place in frontier regions. In Pennsylvania, for example, there was one group of these pioneers who heard that the very peaceful Conestoga Indians had given aid and assistance to enemy tribes of Indians, and so without advice from anybody or the approval of anybody, they simply went and massacred a whole 50 of these uh, peaceful Conestoga Indians, utterly reckless, taking the law entirely into their own hands. Or I could tell you about the region in North Carolina uh, around Alamance. You see Hillsborough there, it's just to the west of there. And the regulator movement there made a real impression on uh, the history of North Carolina. And as I say, I could tell you all kinds of other details about how they simply <clears throat> took matters into their own hands often flying off the handle, you might say, without proper consideration and involving the colony itself in all kinds of complications. They were distressed to the colonial authorities over and over again. This independence, which many sober American colonists considered to be lawlessness, became an almost customary trait as the American pioneers moved west. I'm telling you some of the best things that the Scotch-Irish pioneer introduced. I'm telling you also some of the realistic developments that occurred. Did the Scotch-Irish make any unique contribution to American history? I think they did. To me, their crucial influence was felt in the dramatic years between 1775 and 1789. Recall first that they were numerous in every region, all the way, as I said, from Maine clear down through the back country to Georgia. Much more important was the fact that they felt intense loyalty to the American cause. They had no reason whatever for loving England. England had not done anything for them, and therefore, as I say, they were almost to a man, loyal patriots in the American cause. On the other hand, the English element <coughs> very frequently sided with the mother country, and that, too, is understandable. That was where their first loyalty was. So my point is that these Scotch-Irish in the back country, defending the frontier toward the east, were entirely loyal patriots in the American cause, which not all Englishmen were. as two examples of the fervent patriotism of the Scotch-Irish. Recall that in this very place where we are now, the Rock Ridge settlers named their new town Lexington to celebrate the embattled farmers in Lexington, Massachusetts, who stood up to the Redcoats in 1775 and in Mecklenburg County in North Carolina in 1775, more than a year before the 4th of July in 1776, once again the Scotch-Irish pioneers drew up a declaration of independence from England. And those are just two examples that I could give you of the patriotism <coughs> of these Scotch-Irish. Indeed, the fervor of the Scotch-Irish for independence uh, led King George III, according to a report, to characterize the revolution as a Presbyterian war. <laughs> and
<laughs> Horace Walpole remarked in Parliament, there is no use crying about it. Cousin America has run off with the Presbyterian parson. <laughs> I've already noted the fighting abilities of these backwoodsmen in Washington's army. I should add with uh, somewhat wry amusement that they must really have tried the patience of the general because whenever these Scotch-Irish soldiers felt the need to go home and plant a crop or to harvest a crop or to see how things were getting along at home, they just simply left camp. <laughs> and came back whenever the spirit moved them again. As I say, George Washington had, must have had infinite patience. Perhaps more important than their part in winning the war was their influence in the foundation of the United States government. Not only were these patriots present in great numbers, as I say, in every colony from north to south, as a unifying movement and force, not only had they contributed by fighting in the War of Independence, the very fact that their Presbyterian background had long accustomed them, now listen to what I'm saying, that their Presbyterian form of government had acquainted them with representative government made it easy, therefore, for James Madison, and by the way, don't forget that James Madison was a graduate of Princeton University, to insist on the idea of representative government for the new United States of America. And I think that that presence of the Scotch-Irish in all the colonies made it very much easier for the final vote of approval of the new Constitution of the United States. After the war ended, young Americans simply poured across the Allegheny Mountains <coughs> to start adult life in the fertile and almost free lands of Kentucky and the Ohio Valley. There they met and mingled and intermarried with pioneers from every section of the East, so that if there had ever been any distinctive Scotch-Irish character and personality, it was now simply America. And here I must tell you the curious story of this familiar term, Scotch-Irish. You may be surprised to learn that it was practically unknown in colonial times and even until the 1840s. The quarter of a million people who came over from Ulster in the 18th century considered themselves to be Irish and were so considered and so called by the colonial authorities. Having lived for more than a century in Northern Ireland, these people had acquired a mentality and a manner of life that was different in a great many respects from the Scots. Why then identify them themselves as Scotch Irish? From the purist point of view, I might add that term is an abomination. <laughs> the word Scotch refers to a drink <laughs> or at most to uh, a language, but never to a people. No native of Scotland, I think, would call himself Scotch. He's a Scot or a Scotsman. What needs particular emphasis, though, is the fact that once newcomers from wherever in Europe had actually settled here in America, they hardly ever referred to themselves any longer by any European designation. They were no longer English or Germans or Scots or Irish. They might call themselves New Englanders or Virginians, but chiefly they were simply Americans. 
I find very few European terms of origin in American speech between 1776 and 1840 or 1845. Only in the 1840s did this familiar double term, Scotch-Irish, come into being, and quite frankly, it was a snobbish coinage. You'll remember that for several years after 1845, the potato crop in Ireland failed absolutely with calamitous famine, starvation, and untold misery. One result was a mass migration of Irish peasant immigrants to America. Here, by the way, a, a parenthetical remark may interest you. It's estimated by population experts that the population of Ireland in, eight, in the early 1840s was either seven, somewhere between seven and eight million. And as a result of this famine, all the deaths and the migration, the population dropped to three million. So you can see what a devastating thing that series of famine years actually was. Millions, as I say, migrated to America. And middle class, established Protestant Americans were simply appalled by the influx of these illiterate, Catholic, shanty or bog Irish, as they were called. And prejudices against them took a great many forms. One form, of course, was in the formation of the political party known as the Know Nothing Party, one of whose chief uh, ideas was to prohibit the migration of any more Irish immigrants and to prevent their becoming American citizens. It was in this atmosphere, then, that Americans whose ancestors had come over from Northern Ireland now found comfort in distinguishing themselves as Scotch-Irish, so that the term, I say, was a snobbish invention, really, to distinguish these Protestant Northern Ireland migrants from the bog Irish peasants in the South, from the South. Two final matters need mention. First, religion. I've made a great deal of the fact that these people from Ulster were Presbyterians. By 1776, the three dominant faiths in America were the Anglican, the Congregational, and the Presbyterian. Within a few decades, however, these rock-ribbed, blue-blood Presbyterians, like the Anglicans and the Congregationalists, had lost out to the Methodists and the Baptists, who had been hardly visible in colonial times. And the explanation is very simple. The Methodists and the Baptists made adaptations to the conditions that they found on the American frontier, whereas the Anglicans, the Congregationalists, and the Presbyterians were either unable or unwilling to make such adaptations. Consider only the Presbyterians. They insisted, as they still do, on an educated clergy, and they must have organized congregations governed by a session of elected elders. Well, now across the Alleghenies, farmhouses were scattered over wide areas. Often there were no communities at all. You would have one farmhouse four or five miles away from its nearest neighbor. Congregations, therefore, were almost impossible to form. Educated ministers were few, and there were still fewer churches who could call them, even if they were present. The Methodists, however, were ingenious enough to cope with frontier conditions by the remarkable invention of the circuit rider. Devoted ministers who are willing to travel on horseback over an area covering 30 or 40 square miles, bringing the gospel, the sacraments, 
instruction and consolation to isolated cabins, marrying young couples, burying or having funeral services for those who had died. And these circuit riders were so dedicated and indefatigable that when a period of really foul weather came, the standard remark was, there'll be nobody out today but crows and Methodist ministers. <laughs> <laughs> Baptists introduced an entirely different innovation. Why require ministers, they ask, to have a bookish theological education and degree when the important thing is to tell people simply in plain language of God's love and redeeming grace through Jesus Christ. And so the Baptists licensed thousands of enthusiastic young men, often barely able to, to read, very much I might add, like their neighbors there on the frontier, to preach the gospel in the simplest possible terms and to be pastors to their frontier neighbors. Methodists and Baptists in Kentucky made uh, another remarkable innovation, the week-long camp meeting and revival. And I do wish that I had time to tell you about these camp meetings and revivals. Just imagine the effect of being isolated through long winter months, not being able even to see your nearest neighbor. And now when spring came, these Methodists and Baptists would clear a space in the woods, and people from miles around, sometime, one time at least, as many as 5,000 people flocked to one of these revival services. And there with the rhythmic gospel hymns, with emotional sermons, all their pent-up emotions could give, uh, be given vent. And you can imagine, therefore, how many former Presbyterians and Congregationalists became Methodists and Baptists. <laughs> Could make a rather ribald remark if you said sometimes. No, I, I won't. <laughs> more so for forgotten than saved. <laughs> One footnote may interest you. Uh, the Congregationalists suffered more than, than the Presbyterians in their losses, and the Episcopalians came very near extinction during this period. By 1865, the uh, scholars, in, uh, uh, the religious scholars, estimate that there were fewer than 50,000 Episcopalians in the whole of the United States. Now reflect on that for just a moment, and I think you can understand the reason. Um, the formal ritual of the Episcopalians, the uh, hierarchical government of the Episcopalians, the set prayers of that denomination, and their former connection with England were among the reasons why that denomination made very little appeal to the pioneers as they moved on to the West. And if there were time, we would, though it has no bearing on this particular subject, uh, investigate the question of why the Episcopalians then rose from that low point of 50,000 or so during after the Civil War to the, their present uh, esteem in this country. One final question is whether the Scotch-Irish made a definite impact on American culture, using that term in its broad anthropological sense. They most certainly and assuredly did. 
have noted their part in the revolution, their unifying influence in the formation of the United States, their self-reliant, if sometimes lawless, defense of individual rights. They certainly ventured enthusiastically into politics, and our Scotch-Irish presidents from Andrew Jackson through Woodrow Wilson testified to the mark that they made there. As for economics, I hardly need to say anything about their contributions there, their daring, their self-reliant, imaginative enterprise. In one field, however, they seem to me to have been curiously deficient. In my book on the Scotch-Irish, I have this sentence. In the realm of aesthetics, the Scotch-Irish were and remain practically deaf, dumb, and blind. <laughs> it's almost impossible to think of a painter, a sculptor, a poet, a musician, or an architect who was Scotch-Irish. Even the names they gave to natural features show little creative imagination. Right here in this very area of the valley, consider such unesthetic names as Hogback Mountain, <laughs> Calf Pasture River, Bull Skin Church, and then compare that to the beautiful English names in the Tidewater and uh, New England. But these ancestors of ours left a definite mark on American history and culture. If they were not geniuses and paragons, they were, on the whole, amazingly solid and dependable citizens. And those of us who have Scotch-Irish ancestors can be grateful to them for their wholesome part in the building of America. Thank you.